this early just to make that joke. I'm going back to sleep. No, Ash, hold on. This is important. Pekka, stake out last night. Make this quick. I've still got a few hours before the chief bothers me. Sorry, I'll let you go back to sleep after. It's just that... Wait, you were on a stakeout last night? Oh, hello, priorities. I don't give a shit about his stakeout. I mean, I know where Isabella is. I just don't care. Did I say that? Uh, shit. I just realized I could have exited out from... I, I could have been like, bye, but it's whatever. It's okay, it's fine. Looks like we got down with Ashton and we got up with Isabella because I wasn't mean and said I don't feel like talking to you. <laughs> still a little confused like we've looked at this stuff before. Does it still change? Like does it change with every like I don't know the, the notification? <laughs> The rest of the day slips away in a blur. Despite my best efforts in keeping this morning's events from surfacing in my mind, it sticks. In a way, everything today simply feels like a reminder. Every conversation, regardless of how casual, every topic, no matter how mundane it seems. I blame the news entirely for this. Recent happenings brought quite a few interesting stories to everyone's attention. Most superstitious talk of death. And when locals talk about death here, everyone can sure as hell count on someone bringing up that mansion Isabella sold not a few weeks ago. Even my own students won't stop yapping about it. I think it's even worse than when it was put back in the market. Now there are more stories. If this is the world reminding me of what, it, what matters or simply because the atmosphere around this time of year calls for it, I'd rather take the latter. At least then, I can be sure people will forget about it in favor of another set of holidays after. Nevertheless, this may be, pain may be a painful thing to admit, but listening to them is a pleasant distraction while waiting for Ashton's call. I hope he didn't forget. The school's day is about to end soon. No, that's got nothing with what I heard. You always hear stuff. I'm not sure if half of them's even real. No, really. Rowan knows about it. He used to be in the same class with them. I can hear you from back here, you know. Oh my god, that's Rowan. <laughs> Whatever, Rowan. Anyway, the story goes like this. There were three of them. They entered the mansion on a dare, and they were all never seen again. No one knows what happened to them. Up to this day. Scary shit, man. Cock and bull story. Calling it now. No, you don't get it. Why don't you ask Miss Gales then? Better yet, why don't you go inside the place? I'm betting my allowance you can't do it. The talk immediately halts when I look up, all of them suddenly pretending to be engrossed in their current activity. Still a word to put a stopper to this nonsense is needed. Creativity and imagination fosters by these stories is one thing, but reckless ideas should be corrected before anything potentially tragic comes from it. Back to your worksheets, everyone. And I don't want to hear any talk of dares or going inside that mansion. It's private property now. You'd all better stay away from it before. Wasn't it always private property? Just people... The people didn't go in. At the noise, the whole lot of them go silent. You can almost hear a pin drop. The look on their faces would have made for a funny picture, but that's irrelevant at the moment. If that is a student loitering around, someone's going to be in trouble. I'll be back. If you're done, you can leave your worksheets on my desk. Keep the noise to a minimum while I'm gone, okay? I can sense their eyes on me as I walk out the door, a muted kind of anticipation. A bit unnerving, but it's far more agreeable than the feeling of being watched I've been enduring these past few days. Class is still in session for most of the rooms. In a few hours, once the final bell rings, however, this place will once again be filled with busy chatter and footfalls, an everyday cycle in itself. But for the moment, I let the silence guide me, my ears focusing on whatever sounds there are, or there will be, searching for that distinct clanging of metal. A good minute passes, and for the portion of it, only my steps echoes through the halls. In another. I'm about to turn around, Wend. The sound of it halts my footsteps. It's a little muffled and inf infrequent, but grows louder after each interval. With a hallway devoid of people, 
If I don't put a stop to it soon, it'll start to disturb the other classes still going on. Did somebody get stuffed in a locker? Looking for it doesn't take long. All I do is follow the racket, and shortly I'm standing in front of a nondescript row of unoccupied lockers. And from inside one of- I don't think these lockers are big enough, though. Uh... And from inside one of them, sitting in the middle, comes the noise, annoyingly disruptive now that I've- now that I'm facing it. Like someone's pounding on the metal door from inside, hoping to get out. Leaning forward, I try to get a glimpse through the horizontal slates of whatever's causing it. But in this light, only darkness greets me in another round of clanging, louder than previous. More desperate. I've heard stories before from other schools from a few colleagues who had to deal with it once or twice. Although personally, I've never encountered one myself, and I can only thank the heavens I haven't. But if this is another kid, some other student stuffed in the locker. With a huff, I straighten up and study it briefly with a frown. Without delay, I reach for its handle and. At once it stops, immediately replaced by the muffled sound of a mobile phone ringing. I give the door a few raps before taking my attention away. A second. Another. When nothing or no one responds, I finally avert my eyes and pull out my mobile. Ashton's voice greets me from the other end of the line, oddly cheerful in light of this morning's matters. Or maybe because I'm just expecting some grave or serious news from him. Instead, I get this. Hey, Becca. Well, you sound happy. I do? My voice still sounds the same to me. There are only two things I know of that could be the reason for that tone, sweets, or he's gotten a good lead in his case. From the sound of it, I'm going to assume it's the former, since lately that case is all that's running running inside his head. If there's ever a third one, I've never heard of it yet. It can only be one of the two. Ignore that. How's Isabella? Drove her home a few minutes ago. I think she's sleeping now. Sorry this took a while. Z-Man gave us the puppy eyes after we tried to leave. Had some food prepared for us, apparently. We didn't have the heart to say no. That's alright. You mean Isabella didn't have the heart to say no? Is she okay now? I... I'm not really sure. She didn't say anything to Zack, but she mentioned a plan to take a few days off from work. It was a passing comment before I left her, so I didn't get to ask. Must be because of Rose's death. Could be. It doesn't seem like it from Zack's story, though. He said she was shaking when she got there. Shaking? The word triggers a memory. From three days ago on the way home from her little treat after she sold the mansion, I didn't think much of it at the time, but I won't lie, it scared me. The terrified look on her face, how she sounded when she suddenly screamed. Still there? Yeah, I... I just remembered something. Uh, sorry, don't mind me. Look, if you can talk to her, get the story out of her. That would be great. She wouldn't talk to Zack or me even when I tried. Maybe she'll speak up if it's you? I'll give it a go, but I can't promise anything, okay? You know how stubborn she can get. But... Thanks for letting me know about this. No problem. If anything comes up, just drop me a line, okay? There's a short pause before he cuts the call from his end, and once again I'm alone with my thoughts. But rather than answers, all I get from it are questions. More of them, one on top of the other, as if the world isn't spin isn't planning to give me a break any time soon. But that's a problem I'll tackle later. Right now I've got students who need to be taught follies of eavesdropping, if the slightly open door and their smothered laughter from inside is an indication. All right, enough eavesdropping. So we're not going to question the smacking in the locker, okay? All of you, back to your seats. Is that your boyfriend, Miss Gales? Ugh. None of your business. He totally is. A quick scuffle follows that comment. If there's a retort prepared at the tip of my tongue, I drop every pretense of letting it loose on them. There's no use arguing with teenagers sometimes, boisterous as they all are. They're still my kids, though, rough around the edges, maybe, but still my kids. Shaking my head, I head back to my classroom with a smile, but not before taking a glance at the locker again. It hasn't made a sound since. Oh, must be the wind. So, without another look, I leave it alone. Bruh. Who was that for, just for me? You better watch it! <laughs> all in all, the entire school day ends without a hitch. It would have gone better, mind you, but with the exams nearing, getting out of work before the sun has set looks as though it's a far-off dream for now. 
At least until they're over, then we have the holidays to look forward to. There really are times when you simply take what you can get for the time being. Nothing wrong with that. All I'm hoping for is this will continue until the whole day ends. There's still that promise I made to Ashton, and frankly, the idea alone doesn't sound good. If Isabella didn't talk to them, what makes them think she'll talk to me? It's not like there's a hierarchy, is there? Just because I can handle Isabella's childish tendencies doesn't mean I can do it all the time. Really? Those two give me too much credit. Are you, are you implying that her current state of mind is childish? That's rude as hell. I will nitpick. I told you. I don't like Rebecca. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, if only because I'm also worried about her. And both Zachary and Ashton deem it important that somebody get the story out of her. Here's to hoping it's got nothing to do with that letter again. I understand if she feels a bit stressed lately, but keeping that story going on for more than a week is... Hmm, it's bound to get tiring at one point. Seriously, I merely don't want this to end in another argument, God willing. The cafe special will help smoothen things out. So she is saying that Isabella is drawing out her fear... Like it's some childish thing. Like, completely disregarding the fact that Isabella basically had a breakdown in public. Like, you don't just suddenly scream. Ooh, towing the line here. <laughs> Not even towing the line. I'm already, she's already on my get rid of list. Yeah, sure, like, I put Marianne on that list, and I still let her live, but... You never know. You don't know how I feel in the moment. <laughs> Seriously, I merely don't want this to end in another argument, God willing, the cafe... God willing, the cafe special will help smoothen things out. After all, it's always been food with her. Or money. But mostly food. <laughs> At this hour, the cafe is usually filled to the brim with people. That's the reason Isabella and I rarely ever go here during the evenings. It's simply too much of a hassle when we can prepare food ourselves in the comfort of our homes. And there really isn't much reason to eat out lately. What with life going on a busy streak. No time for long lines. Better spend that doing something productive, yes? Lucky there isn't one tonight. Oh yeah! And on another note... Like... No sympathy of her mental health after her friend and many of her empl like fellow employees died? Like, hello? You are something else, Rebecca. <laughs> Only a few people are idling by the counter. Four of them, in fact, a woman in her 60s and a teenager busy with his phone. Both are just waiting to be served their orders. The other two, a posh-looking man and a child who I immediately recognize as Kylie, appear to have not yet picked anything they want. For some reason, my stare lingers on the guy. Though dressed relatively well and looks harmless, I haven't seen him around these parts before. Someone new in the neighborhood, perhaps. Even so, there's something familiar in him. It feels like I've seen him somewhere before. That also begs the question of why Kylie is with him. Of course, a girl easily takes a liking to anyone who buys her sweets, so it's both a bit worrisome, wor worrisome and unsurprising. The blonde bloke doesn't look particularly, particularly thrilled with the company, though. I turn my eyes away from them soon enough once a guy at the counter appears ready to take my order. That, and I'd also hate to, to be accused of ogling strangers. Two. Evening special. Take out. He's already punching the order before I even finish, saying my order out loud is really more for formality's sake and made out of habit. He has known Isabella and I long enough that if we ever drop by here, he already knows it's always because I'm b buying dinner for the two of us. I rarely visit here alone if I can help it, but Isabella can sometimes be a bad influence. He gives me a small smile before leaving to prepare my order while I fish for my wallet when... Look, you little ankle biter. If I buy you the biggest parfait they have, Will you please, please behave? Uh, sounds super suspicious. I would just like five. No, ten minutes of peace and quiet. You said you'll get me some bread pudding this time. Yeah, well, darling, they said they ran out of it. Just pick another one so we can be on our way. Their parfait doesn't look as cute as the one my mom bought me. 
Parfait is just ice cream, sweetheart. It'll melt no matter how dainty it appears. In the end, it'll all look like an ugly puddle. Now, come on, just pick one. It could even be the most expensive one on that list. I don't give a shit. Care, I don't care. Oh, what I would give for someone to buy you off my hands right now. I don't think anyone wants her. Let's be honest. What? My whole attention in instantly snaps back to them in their conversation. Jumping to come to conclusions isn't something I'm particularly fond of, especially when all I have are baseless assumptions, but you can't really trust a stranger these days. No one around the cafe seems to have noticed his words either. Very suspicious words. Still, I don't move. Yet. But my hand has already shifted from my wallet to the book I'm carrying. A hardbound textbook looks harmless, but if a situation calls for it, it might be a good deadly weapon. Might. I haven't gotten the chance to try it anywhere so far. Today could be the day. But you promised! Look, if you don't want a parfait, how about... How about a bonafide pie? I'm sure it'll taste just as good as any other bread pudding. I'll even buy you the entire tray. How does that sound? That's not what you said before. Well, sweetheart, adults change their minds sometimes. You said if I come with you, you'll buy me a bread pudding, and I did, and now you won't keep your promise. Beep, 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 beep. Uh, police? <laughs> There's a suspicious man with a little girl, and they're saying stuff that sounds very, like, not great. I'm just saying, I don't trust this man. I want to go home. I miss my mom. I really don't trust this man. No, darling, if I remember correctly, and I have a good memory, honey. What I said was, if you come quietly with me, I might buy you one. The quiet part didn't happen. Though, now that I'm sober, I think this is a bad idea. I should just ship you someplace else for that peace and quiet. <laughs> Hurry! <laughs> Hurry, I don't trust this man at all! Oh, that's it. No hesitation. In a few paces, he's within my reach, and without warning, I'm slamming the flat area of the book against his skull. I feel like you probably should have asked questions first before throwing a book around, especially considering you're in a public area with other people and you could get their help. It's not like you're in the middle of a empty-ass park. There's a cry of pain followed by him instantly crouching down, hands nursing the sore spot. Almost comically, if this were a different situation and the safety of a St. Goretti student isn't at stake, well... I'd probably feel sorry for him. I mean, has anyone seen how thick this book is? Behind me, Kylie. <gasps> Miss Pink! It's amusing how fast her expression changes from the pouty one earlier to something that... that of utter delight upon seeing me. But there's no time for any pleasantries, not even quick ones, because soon the man straightens and I'm readying my favorite new found weapon for another hit. Except this time, he's ready, and before I can land another one, his hand shoots up to catch my wrist in a firm hold. Damn, look how angry he is. And the look on his face. Hell, woman. What's your problem? Kidnapper. To say he's pissed would be a complete understatement. Had I been the weak-willed sort, I'd probably cower under his sh sharp gaze. But that simply isn't how I roll. If he thinks he can scare me and do as he pleases here... Just because I'm a woman, or whatever his reasons may be, he's got another thing coming for him. So instead, I return to him with the same intensity, with the same venom. What's my problem? You're the one who has a problem here. Rotten bow bags like you don't deserve the freedom to run this town. What are you doing to this girl? And why is that any of your business, pray tell? Because you s <laughs> sure sound like a child napper, you dumbass. Oh, it's my business if I make it to be. Now, release me or I'll call the police! <laughs> you think that scares me, Daisy? I have a name, you sleazy douchebag! Oh, I'm sure. His grip on my hand only tightens when I attempt to shake it off. His tone may be dripping with anger and sarcasm, but the gleam in his eyes says it all. He's getting a kick out of this. Riling people up, getting on their nerves, invading their personal space. He knows exactly what and which, put which buttons to push. 
The nerve of this person. The nerve of this arsehole. If he thinks I'm going to get give in to his goading please, he might as well just kiss his sorry behind. In fact, why not do the most sensible thing right now? Teach him a tough les lesson. Oh, uh, you know which one I'm going to choose. Mister, you have until the count of five to let me go and step out of my personal space. A fair warning. Fairer than any I can offer for people of his kind and I'm already being considerate. Now this arsehole doesn't even deserve a warning. If he doesn't listen, well, he is as much responsible for what will happen next as anyone. Or else what? Such vulgar words coming out of that pretty mouth. A gorgeous flower like you shouldn't even be saying. Don't say I didn't warn you, Bobag. Mm -hmm. Love of that intensity, Daisy. Luke is always just horny as fuck. FYI, I like feisty in a woman. It gives them this certain charm. Why don't you? Five. A second of silence. Then, without any preamble, my leg moves in one fluid motion and delivers a swift, powerful, well-placed kick to his nether regions. Nuts and bolts. <laughs> Needless to say, the effect is instantaneous. He yelps, abruptly drops his hold on me, and kneels over, howling from the pain. I can see tears forming at the corners of his eyes, too, though the mere sight of it prompts not an ounce of remorse from me. I would have been gentler if he isn't such a dirty little prick with an ego too big for his head. Too bad. Whether this obliterates any chance of him ever procreating remains to be known, but a part of me is already praying he doesn't ever breed after this. Well, that's too late, because he already has two on the way. <laughs> we have no need for more of him in this world. Well, you, you mad woman! well, technically, who knows how many he has, considering that he sleeps around. I warned you, you ass. Why, you... This is harassment, I'm telling you! Harassment! Then why don't you tell that to the police once they get here, hmm? You despicable! Whatever you're assuming I am, I'll have you know it's all in your head. None of it's true. You best have that pretty brain of yours checked before that gets worse. What is wrong with you? Is this the face of someone who'd do anything suspicious? Oh? You don't think a stranger luring an innocent child with promises of sweets before whisking them away from their parents doesn't warrant any suspicion? You have a very funny definition of suspicious, asshole. Maybe you're the one who should have that head of yours checked. The kid asked me to buy her sweets. You're the one who's suspicious here. I'll have you know, I have a wife. <laughs> I don't think that stops you, bro. That much at least appears to have a sliver of truth. He even makes a show of brandishing his left hand to my face with much flourish. Sure enough, a wedding ring is there, though at all that earned him is an unimpressed glare from me. Immediately, a small part of me starts to feel sorry for whoever, whatever, poor woman married the sod. I don't understand why he has to bring her up either, as if the mention of her alone will magically present a solution to his problem. She must truly be a remarkable woman if she can handle a dirtbag like him. And even my wife, my wife of all people in this bloody city, has never, never, I'm telling you, accused me of such a scandalous thing, you crazy woman! Married or not, you're still a sleaze. Honestly, I feel... Miss Pink, why are you fighting with my Teo? Why did you kick my Teo in the balls? Whatever words still left to be said here dies on my tongue. The same thing goes for the sleaze. Besides us standing, Kylie, gawking at us with the same curious stare she often brings with her. I know that look all too well, a precocious child through and through. She doesn't say anything further, her gaze simply moves between us, eyeing us both carefully, clearly anticipating an answer. From my experience, when it gets like this with children her age, is a sure sign they won't leave you until you've given them an answer they're satisfied with. Lying won't do either. It has dissolved into a shouting match, for heaven's sake. And did she just say Tio? Something falls straight to the pit of my stomach at that, but my tone is gentle when I finally address her, void of any apprehension and 
what might be the first hint of embarrassment. I pointedly ignore the latter. I can very well be just... It can very well just be the hunger speaking. Kindly, sweetie. Do you know this... this... this oaf? Yeah, he's Tio Wu. Right at the moment, my brain stops. Every line of thought, every argument I still have against the man besides me dissipates in a haze. I miss all of it when memory gets triggered from a few days ago. Tio? The... the one you mentioned before? The uncle? The guy Rowan wanted to impress. Or, or was that a dare? I'm sorry, I can't recall. Is it the one who promised he'll take Big Brother someplace cool? Yeah, the one in the same! Don't you know who he is? I sure as hell don't, darling. Because if I do, I wouldn't have let everything I've said earlier come out of my mouth. He's my T.O. Luke! Gazillionaire, extraordinaire, and my... No. The fairy godfather! Oh. Oh. You're... He's your godfather. That's... That's nice. The one and only. Did I get that right, T.O.? More than right, sweetheart. I still sounds suspicious. I'm sure Miss Pink here understood everything you said quite perfectly. Whatever it is that landed at the bottom of my stomach prior has shot straight up to my face and stayed there. The heat from it slowly spreading to my cheeks, coloring my face in almost the same shade as my hair. If only the earth would swallow me whole here and now. His eyes are on me. I can feel them jeering and mocking. Can't even bring myself to look at him. What's in there? Amusement, I doubt it. He's probably having the time of his life right now. But I know, I can hear the sneer in his tone alone when he talks. He has that smug grin on him, which I may or may not want to punch off his face at present just for the hell of it. But damage control. I need to do some damage control before, his whole th before this whole thing goes south. I honestly don't like Kylie. <laughs> Freaks me out. Though it pains me to apologize to a sleaze bag like him, this is my mistake. With Kylie watching us close by, I don't want to set a bad example for her, do I? I'm surprised she grew up the child she is. If anything, I want to be the role model this man couldn't possibly become from her. For her. Even if it means taking a few blows to my ego and stroking his insufferable one. A deep gulp of air, a short moment to swallow my self-respect, and then I'm facing him. The words are out of my mouth in a single breath. I'm really, really sorry, sir. I did not... I had no idea. His smirk is impossible to miss. He's not making an effort to hide it, and even the smile is so, so irritatingly present in his tone. If I could slap it off him, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Now, now, it's an honest mistake, Daisy. No, I really mean it. I actually thought you were... And then... It's fine now. It probably happens quite a lot to a few people who look suspicious to you. I mean, you don't just look suspicious. You sounded real suspicious. Seems I'm one of them now. But don't lose sleep over it. Do be careful with that book, though. A little more and you would have dislodged my poor brain off my head. What would I ever do if that happens? Oh, no! Did it leave a mark or anything? If you want, we can have it checked. I'll handle the expenses if there's a need for it. Now, what kind of man would I be if I let an attractive woman such as yourself do that? <laughs> Why don't we just look at it this way? My forgiveness is coming from the utter goodness of my heart. So full of himself. Exactly the kind of person I'll happily leave to die in a ditch somewhere. Of course, sir. Why didn't I think of it that way? I know, right? But even someone as... Capable as you is bound to have a few lapses. No harm done, Daisy. Let's move on from this. Well, if you're going to put it like that, then I guess there's nothing left for us to talk about. <laughs> I figured as much. Awkward. The whole exchange is nothing but an awkward display of fake pleasantries. One that brings much agony to the very pride I am willingly held back a while ago. I might need a drink later so I can forget any of this ever happened. Who would have thought the time would come when I'd meet someone tougher to handle than Isabella? Miracles of miracles, I swear. Though to my surprise, he proffers a sh hand shortly before they leave. For a shake, I reala realize after a long minute of staring at it. I accept it, albeit half-heartedly. 
But all of the goodwill of that small gesture represents melts into thin air when he winks at me. Winks. The gall of this man. However, there's no moment to ponder about it. Seconds later, the man at the counter waves me over and hands me a paper bag as soon as I've paid. He offers me another smile before I leave. Normally, I return it simply for the sake of returning it, or I don't at all, with the latter happening more commonly. For the time being, I do so freely. After that encounter and the scene we've caused, seeing a friendly gesture being extended to me, albeit from a person I barely know on a personal level, it feels like a reassurance despite bearing no promise of better days. I take what little I can of it with me as I step out into the night. A cloudless night sky greets me when I walk out of the cafe beyond the tall buildings a blanket of stars spread out before me. Isabella once told me that the place, the best place to view it is some place outside the city, away from the noise and the obtrusive lights. She'd seen it once in her mom's hometown, in another time in the university she used to attend, and she asked if it's possible to try out here sometime. I agree with her at the time, if only because she appeared excited at the mere prospect of it. We made those little plans along with Zachary and Ashton. Though up until now we've never got around it. Even so, I find myself enjoying this, despite being told it's only half the experience. Little things, you know, stuff you learn to appreciate when you're alone. Because at certain times you get to meet people who are unfortunately born with the innate talent to ruin, mood, to ruin the mood and the scene with their mere existence alone. For example, the very driver of the car fast approaching my direction. Luckily he didn't notice me, but the fleeting moment we pass each other by gives me a brief glance at the people he's with. Kylie sitting on the back seat with a serving bread pudding in her hands, and beside him, it must be his wife. His horrifying wife. He takes a turn and disappears at the nearest corner, but throughout the night that cursory glimpse of all things to bother me has left me wondering what kind of person his wife is, and more than that, it's a silent prayer to the universe. I hope I don't ever cross paths with that douche again. After having such an eventful day, anyone will think nothing will surprise me anymore. But here I am, standing at the top of the stairwell, watching an odd scene unfold before me. Relief crosses my mind first, followed by confusion. What is she doing there? Although given, although given what happened this morning, the question feels a bit inappropriate to ask directly. What's important is Isabel is here. She's sitting cross-legged on the hallway, just right in front of a room with several papers and folders scattered about. Each of them seems as important as the next. More than once, upon giving the scene a quick scan, I spot Briar, Re I spot Briar Realty's logo at the topmost area of the pages. Everything considered, it looks like a mess made by a third grader working on, a cr working on crunch time. The landlady will have a few things to say about this when she finds out. I have a few things to say about this myself, in fact. But something in the calm, focused manner she holds herself at present keeps me from disturbing her from that reminder. She goes through each paper with this intensity. Her brows are furrowed, lips in a tight line, both hands moving in precise movements as she shifts through each sheet. When she finds something of note, she moves closer, nose almost touching whatever paper she's holding, and grabs a phone to call someone. Ah, hello. Sorry to call you this late. There's something I just want to confirm, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh. Okay. Thanks anyway. Not that one, either. She's a cycle. She goes through call after call, then after the last one ends, she shuffles through the pile again and dials another number. Is it work? I've never seen her this engrossed with her own work before. Otherwise, she would have noticed my presence the moment, the moment I've reached our floor. After the ninth call, she appears as oblivious to it as when I've arrived. When she lets out a loud sigh this time, I immediately take that as an opportunity to interrupt. Isabella, you know the house rules here. And once her head jerks back and hits the concrete wall behind her with a thump. That's the Isabella I know. I'm glad it's still there. I allow her a moment to nurse it before speaking again. Becca, you're late. Yeah, I ran into a little trouble at the cafe. But I brought food for the two of us, if you haven't eaten anything yet. As anticipated, she grins once I raise the bag of food I'm holding. Yet it doesn't reach her eyes. There's, not There's nothing of the cheerful glint in it this time. Just a hollow tone for the sake of being polite. Ashton's right. Something's happened. Yeah, I... Maybe later. I've gotta finish this first. Just leave it here. I'll eat it once I'm done. Thanks, Becca. You can't eat this here. You know how the landlady would react. 
Why are you even working outside? Your room's right there. I, I, I know. Sorry. It, it just feels stuffy in my apartment right now. I'll go back inside once everything's been aired out. I promise. That has never bothered you before. Well, it bothers me now. Oh, really? Just now? I find that hard to believe. Yeah? Sh shouldn't you be happy? I mean, you've been complaining even if it's not your room. Now I know how you're feeling when it's messy, so I'm going to clean. Isn't that a good thing? In spite of what's supposed to be good news, an exhale comes from me drawn out and slow. It's a good thing, Isabella. Believe me. But you're as bad as Zachary at lying. What's really going on? She hastily averts her eyes, as Shafaya indicated this is going to be one of those lengthy conversations that can possibly end with the other person angry. Again. It's one thing I'd like to avoid tonight at all costs. Still, I've made a promise to Ashton and Zachary. If she didn't talk to them, who else is she going to talk to? She keeps this all to herself, who knows what might happen. Isabella, you can tell me. Is it about your family? A slight movement of her lips, although a frown, it's a reaction at least. I'm getting Bruce. there. She merely shakes her head. Just a little more. Come on, I know something happened. I don't know if it's because of Rose, but I know it's related to her somehow. You weren't here when I visited this morning, and both Zachary and Ashton are worried about you. If you don't want to tell them, you can tell me. No thanks. Does it have something to do with work? Office? If I didn't know her, I might have missed it. She shifts then, her fists clenching tight and teeth biting her lower lip, and there's... fear. The look of terror in her is the last thing I expected to see out of everything. Her mouth trembles briefly before she opens them. When she finally voices it out, the words simply spill out of her mouth. One after another. All of it. True to what I've promised her, I listen. Because this is something she's been keeping to herself, even from the two most dependable people I know. The fact she chooses to tell me, this speaks a lot to me. Becca, she... she was there again. Last night? In the office? Boss passed me all of Rose's lurk load yesterday. For the Ermengarde mansion. I had to stay late to finish them all. And then... and then... When I was about to go home... I saw her. I saw her again. She was standing in front of me again last night, Becca. I couldn't get away. She was... she was blocking the door. If I hadn't hidden myself, even if I made the tiniest noise, if she found me... Becca, she almost did! If she saw me under my table, I... I think that would have made the end of it. I'm scared. I'm so scared I won't be able to do anything. By the end, her hands are trembling and her breathing comes out in rasping intervals. For a long moment, I let the silence stretch out between us, let her sobs fill it instead. But even as her soft whimpers die down minutes later, there's a heaviness hanging in the air. Not just from her, but also from me. From my exasperation over this whole matter, from my own frustrations over her stupid superstitions... When she could do us all a favor and grow a backbone. Okay, fuck you, Rebecca. Like, <laughs> fuck you beforehand. Fuck you even more. <laughs> she may be young, but she's no longer that young. It's about time to put an end to this. She can't keep going on like this. She's still got plenty of years to live out. And what if she goes home? What if we're no longer there to keep her fears in line with what's real? What would she do then? I'm more afraid for her for what the kind of imagination will do to her than of what some imaginary monster could. But with the manner she's looking at me right now, there's an expectation in it. A hope and a plea sewn together. I knew it. I freaking If I was in control, I wouldn't have said anything to Rebecca. <laughs> if we were doing Isabella's thing and it was all like, Tell Rebecca what happened, don't tell it. Immediately would hit, don't tell. There's an expectation in it, a hope and a plea sewn together. She wants me to believe her this time. If it's like that, then what am I supposed to say now? What she wants to hear or what she needs to hear? Is this why you didn't go home last night? This again? Well, I'm not going to be a bitch. 
As much as I want to set her straight, a reprimand isn't what she needs right now. With that pouty face she's giving me, I doubt it'll ever end well if I push it. I know her. When she wants to be stubborn, she's stubborn. But there are moments when she can be ac acquiescing too. Times when she'll be more accepting of what I tell her despite her inclination to disagree with it. That talk can wait. In the meantime, I'll be the ear that listens to her without judging her, without criticizing her despite my own opinions on it. You should have called me. <laughs> she stares at me like I've grown another head and laughter slips out before I can stop myself. There? I can't do that! What will you do? Hit her with a book? You'll be dead before that happens. And that isn't what I'm talking about. After, after you got out, you should have phoned me. You didn't have to go to Zachary's. The corners of her mouth curl up a sheepish, a sheepish smile. By general definition, but this is Isabella. Her smiles are never half-hearted, never lax or high spirit. In spite of this, I know everything's going to be okay. Somehow. After all, she's learned how to pick herself up long ago, long before we met. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Wasn't exactly of sound mind when it happened. I don't even remember how I ended up in Zack's place. I was in a hurry to get out of the office. And it was already late. Besides, I don't really think you'll believe me if I wake you up over something like that. That's beside the point. True or not, there are people who will always be concerned about you. I just, I can't help it. She says this, but you know her ass would have, would have, like, been so upset if she called her. Like, what are you crying about? What ghost? You're not a baby anymore. <laughs> There's Zachary, but he's the first person you went to, and you didn't tell him anything. You just slept there. There's... There's Ashton, too, and me. But how do you think I'll be able to explain to your aunt or your family if you suddenly disappeared? Think about that. Right, right. I'll remember that next time. I'll try to remember it when I'm not, like, in fear for my life. <laughs> and then she grins. Playful and mischievous, a preamble to an old banter. Still not quite there, still not quite her usual self, but with it, I know we're bound to get her back soon. Mom, I told you not to call me that. <laughs> I send an elbow to her side for added measure, but when laughter follows a familiar gesture, none of it is unexpected. This is what's comfortable. This is how we found an equal ground despite our stark differences. So for the moment, I accept things as they are. Afterwards, a hush stretches out before us. For Isabella, this is rare. This isn't her. Yet in this moment, as she fiddles with the edge of another paper near her, as she hugs her knees close to herself and lets a pensive expression linger on her, it feels strangely fitting. As if this is where everything's supposed to lead to if we allowed it long ago. Seconds later, the moment is broken by the sound of a door easing open and a voice begging some little peace. How many times have I told you girls not to loiter around the hallway? It's noisy. Some people here are trying to sleep. Quiet down or go do your talking inside. I'm pinning a memo to your door the next time this happens. Okay, whatever, tight ass. <sighs> Millennials. Okay, boomer. Sorry, I won't do it again. <laughs> You'd better. can't wait to die in, in, in your freaking land and make you make all of your whatever drop no one wants to come here I need to go to the extremes it's the only way I can get back at her the door closes and Isabella starts gathering the mess she's made carefully sacking them all in her arm at a loss of what to do I help her pick them and for the first time I get a closer look at it Completely unintentional, of course, but it catches my attention that nevertheless in a confusion and a confused frown makes its way to my face. Why is she looking through this? I look to her for an explanation, but she merely ignores the question in my eyes, takes the paper off my hands, and finishes cleaning up. The last paper she puts on top is a letter, the one she supposedly found in the mansion and what's probably the root cause of this odd behavior. I shoot her a, que a questioning look for that, too. But all she gives me is a smile, and in a halting tone, 
so completely unlike her. Becca, I'll... I'll find a way out of this. You guys don't have to worry about me. Anyways, I should go. I'll see you later. Where are you going? Getting myself some food. Don't wait for me. Isabella walks away before I can stop her, before I can remind her I've brought food enough for the two of us. She quickly disappears down the stairwell while I'm left standing in an empty hallway, holding two bags of takeout. One of them will go uneaten tonight. Just an innocent passing thought. One that I don't dwell much on as I head back to my room. I ignore all of it in the same way I've assumed I won't ever encounter that douche again. The brief lull the past two days has offered is nice while it lasted. Or as nice as as it can get with the worries of Isabella's whereabouts creeping up to me every now and then. She hasn't showed up after that last talk we had in the hallway and the dinner I've bought had since been given to a different neighbor before it spoils. By all means, this shouldn't be anything to lose sleep over. She's gone on work trips before, usually for a day or two. This might simply be one of those. Though it's often with a message saying exactly where. But it's a dour note she has ended our last chat with that Nas. Like an ugly premonition. And as expected, just as things start to settle and a steady rhythm finally warms its way back to my routine, Thursday morning's Thursday morning brings further disturbance to the now calm waters, with little ceremony though still enough to ripple through everything. In retrospect, I really should have seen this coming. Luxbourne is a small city, relatively speaking, compared to, say, London or Glasgow. It's nothing but a tiny mass of land boasting mere population of 68,000. But these numbers alone are nothing to scoff at when standing in a busy street. And when you pay close enough attention, facing... Faces take the crosswalk of riding the subway will soon grow familiar. How unfortunate that out of that number it had to be T.O. fucking Luke. I encounter more than once. Oh, you know, a few problems popping up here and there that the agents failed to tell us somehow. I think a few hired hands can't fix, of course. I would have preferred a place near the city and something that's new to save us all the trouble. But darling wife insisted. Ah, <sighs> who am I to say no? Ah, oh, are you kidding me? His smug head is the first thing I see upon turning into the hall, in spite of the small crowd of parents and students gathered at the corridor for the primary's career day. It's not that he stands out, he's pretty unremarkable at first glance, frankly. However, it's his countenance that draws people's eyes to him. The manner he carries himself with all the confidence in the world, his mere presence dwarfing everything around him. I'm willing to make a bet he's also enjoying the attention it garners him, especially the ones coming from the women. What an ass. Single glance at him and I know Im immediately that one way or another, if we ever bump into each other again, my day will effectively be ruined in some capacity. He also exudes that air. The sort that makes you want to run him over with a lorry and pass it off as an unfortunate accident. With him it's either you want to punch him or let yourself be charmed, there's no in-between. I'll gladly do the honor of the former myself, but alas, there are our people around us. Now I'm stuck with having to face one of the two. I shouldn't have volunteered. At the time, helping out sounded a good idea. I have no classes left today until after lunch. I've opted to stay at the teacher's lounge and work on my lesson plans, but that means being left alone with our deputy head in his chatter. He's a good man, but... Crivens. He can talk anyone's ear off. But the moment an opportunity rose, I jumped on it. It's a simple task to boot. Does it deliver a whole box of materials and a few posters for the event? Maybe stay around to assist if time will allow it. I just wasn't expecting him to show up here. Out of the frying pan and into the fire. Had I known, I would have stayed and suffered through our deputy's impromptu speeches about his life crisis instead. But what's done is done. Going back is also out of the question. With how unexpectedly heavy the load I'm carrying is, I'd hate to lug this for a trip back just because my pride can't take another second of in interaction with the guy. He's insufferable, all right, but I've had my fair share of dealings with teens of more or less the same temperament, all considerably younger than him, and they listened. If he wants to be difficult like last time, so be it, but he can bet his sorry English ass, I'm not standing down. 
Left with no other choice, I brace myself and suck in a breath, mustering every bit of, of patience I have as I step into the hall. My grip on the box tightens when I pull it closer to me and attempt to as assume a low-key air as I amble towards the room. The box is not big enough to hide my face even with the stuff piled on top, but if all else fails, I can just hit him with it. Still, a small prayer forms in my head. If there's not one listening out there, please grant me enough restraint. Better yet, I hope he doesn't notice me at all. That will definitely make my life easier. Seriously, how hard can it be? He's standing a few ways from the door and there are plenty of people between us to use for cover. If I'm careful, I can just go in, hand in the stupid box to whoever's in charge, forget every plan of staying longer than necessary, and step out as soon as I can. Easy as pie. But as luck would have it, the, ex the exact moment I reach the room's threshold, something, someone, barrels towards me. She latches onto my waist before topping the sudden commotion with a gleeful squeal. I the force of it nearly throws me off balance, sending the item stacked atop the box, tilting dangerously to the sides. With a child's added waist weight at my waist, pinning me on the spot and both of my hands occupied, watching is the last is the only thing I'm able to do. A short seconds in between slows as everything gradually slides off the box's small surface. Under different circumstances, this would have made her made for a funny story some other time. Comical even until another set of hands reaches out and steadies the post is threatening to take a nosedive right to the floor. Oh, careful now, Daisy. Don't make a mess here. My entire body freezes. Upon hearing his voice alone, an irrational impulse to hit him immediately bubbles up. But before my limbs could catch up with what my brain is currently screaming at me, he moves to take the burden off my arms. Irritation gives way to surprise. Then confusion. It is in that moment when instinct finally kicks in, I tug the box closer to me before he can fully lift it off. What are you doing? What does it look like? You're surprisingly slow on the uptake for someone of your profession, aren't you? Uh, bloody, doesn't this school have people for this kind of work? <laughs> so much for being a center of academic excellence. I am going to ignore that slight to my alma mater and my work, because that's not what I'm trying to get at. You know what? Why don't we just rephrase that to something you'll easily understand? Why exactly are you doing this? Well, you look like you could use a bit of help. Have you seen your face while you were heaving this around? Mister, I'm pretty sure if there's ever a look on my face, it's entirely because I saw something extremely unpleasant this morning. <laughs> aren't you a ball of sunshine today, Daisy? Having a bad day, aren't we? Oh, you have no idea. I'd put it away if I were you. You might scare the children. You don't have to worry about that. This isn't my department. I was just asked to bring these. Anyway, I can handle this myself, mister. The room's just right over there. Behind you, in fact. Now, if you could please move over and make way, it would do the whole world some good. Keeping my voice level throughout it is a mere is a miracle in itself, but regardless of how polite my request is, he doesn't budge. Did what I've just said merely fly over his head? Would my choice of words really that difficult to comprehend? Surely it shouldn't be that hard. I think he might be a little touched in the head. I'd like to ask him that, actually, but Kylie chooses that instant to pipe in. Don't worry, Miss Pink. Tio's strong. You can leave this to him. My papa does it lots of times. But I'm not allowed to talk about it to anyone. Tio says it's confi confide <laughs> confidential munchkin. That's right. Tio's smart, isn't he, Miss Pink? I'm still of the opinion that he's a piece of shite, but I must admit his goddaughter's excitement is contagious, as always. A smile makes its way to my lips. He has yet to budge from her place, though to be honest, I'm starting to lose some feeling on my stomach with how tightly she's wound her arms around it. I'm sure he is, Kylie. But I'm also sure he'll find better use for it elsewhere. Like helping you out? Oh, well, that's one thing, but... <laughs> you heard the kid. No one's asking you. Oh, you wound me, woman. And I'm quite certain I can do more damage than that. Shall we give it a try? Again? 
He pales, stammers for a bit, until he ultimately decides against saying anything and settles for a brief show of discomfort instead. He's probably having flashbacks of the last time we met. His composure when he finally regains some of his bearings says it all. It's nothing sort of hilarious if I do say so myself. I'll have you know that threats never work on me, Daisy. Not in a million years, not ever. You're assuming it's a threat. How cute. But th that too, I'm not scared of you. Just because you landed a hit. Uh -huh. Do go on, keep telling yourself that. It was a fluke, you hear? I was caught off guard and your damn book left a dent. If I end up in a hospital because of what you did, I'm sending the chief of Luxburg police after you, woman. You don't say. Just give me that bloody box. He snatches it out of my arms before a single word of protest e exits my mouth and quickly disappears behind the classroom. Not that it matters who brings it in now, my prior irritation has already melted into amusement. He's not so bad once you figure out how his temperament works, it's almost similar to a child. Though I still have to ask. Kylie, did your Tio eat something bad before coming here? He's unusually nice today. A far-fetched idea, I know, but it's the only reason I can think of why his arsehole is suddenly acting like a decent human. He's, quite frankly, far from being. First and foremost, we didn't end our last meeting on a good note. If I were him, I'd avoid the very person who put a dent, dent in his skull, as he so aptly put it. Why is he acting friendly two days later? He always is, but I made him promise to be extra nice to you since you helped me so much. I think you're going to be great friends. I quickly stomp on the urge to groan loudly or gag at that. He's the last person I'd ever want to be chummy with in this whole city, but Kylie doesn't need to know that. Are you sure it's not something he ate during breakfast? I gave him some jelly babies this morning. Really brought me lots of them. Mama said I should share, so I offered half of it to Tia when he picked me up. He likes the black ones. Oh, that's probably why he's weird. Jelly baby overdose. He could have done everyone a favor and choked on them while he's at it. Do you want some? I've got more! I couldn't play Melody or Chikonko this morning, but I'm sure it'll be fine sharing some of it with you. No, I'm not really very fond of them. I was just asking. Oh, where's your mom, by the way? Out of town with Papa. An unexpected pang hits me at her words. The statement, though innocent enough, unearths a whole trunk of memories from childhood. So eerily familiar. Nights spent eating dinners alone, the number of days coming home to an empty house growing with each passing year, and sometimes several Christmas Eves spent with the relatives instead of my own family. It's too late to think about it now, but when I remember the dull ache is still there, familiar though familiar though lessened by the years now. Besides me, Kylie takes a step back, having gotten tired of clinging to me, there's nothing but cheer in her. She doesn't seem too affected by the fact. Although it makes me wonder how much of it is real and how much is there to mass loneliness if there's even one. What a lucky child. Weren't they informed of career day beforehand? Yeah, I told them all about it. Mama was looking forward to it. And they still left? Uh-huh. It's important business, so it can't be helped. They promised to tell me about it when they come back tomorrow, though. Papa said he'll give me a gift if I behave. I've been a good girl, right, Miss Pink? You always are. But they asked that douche, I mean, they asked your Tio to look after you? For this? Nope, they didn't. No? Then how? It was supposed to be Tia. Mama likes her better than Tio, so she asked her, but she's sick and had to visit the doctor today. Oh, that's supposed to be a secret, by the way. Oh, but I think it's a bit confusing because Tio said she also went shopping. That's unfair. Don't you think so, Miss Pink? Mama doesn't allow me to go out when I'm sick. It's still okay, though, since Tio always buys me sweets before we go home. I'm gonna ask for a parfait today. Extra large. Don't tell Takako, okay? Listening to her like this, it's easy to get a picture of where Kylie's fondness for the guy comes from. She's far from a demanding child unless you've made a promise of some sort. She never forgets those. She'll make friends with anyone wherever she is. Buy her a few things and voila, you're settled. I wonder she's so attached to the man, the douche probably showers her with gifts whenever he can. I can't say if the sentiment's the same for the latter, however. He doesn't seem the type and probably just does it for the sake of getting some peace and quiet whenever he's with a girl. Classic techniques. But before that, I'm gonna show him to everyone! 
one first. It's gonna be great! No one else has a gazillionaire fairy godfather. Also, also, when I grow up, I'm gonna be exactly like him and marry someone really handsome. Like Tia did! That way, I can be awesome too! There's some sort of misguided logic in there that I'd like to correct. But before I can say my piece, Douchebag steps in, fresh out of the commotion from the classroom behind us, and plows into the conversation with every subtlety a wrecking ball has. No shite given, despite no one asking for his opinion. Munchkin, sweetie, trust me. You don't have to marry someone for that to happen. I don't? <laughs> Just do your thing, darling. I'm quite sure you can do great things on your own without lugging around the extra baggage with you. He married you. Hallie drops a statement without any sort of preface, and the moment it lands, the douche finds himself grappling with the conversation. Yeah, I, well, that's... That's true, Munchkin, technically. But it's not the same thing. A small frown creases the girl's eyebrows as she tries to comprehend her Tio's rather vague explanation. It's not surprising, either, when Luke tenses under the child's questioning gaze. It's familiar. I've seen the same look a great deal of times of times before. On Ashton, whenever he's trying to say something he can't quite phrase. Another second passes before the douche moves, kneeling in front of Kylie and placing both his hands on either sides of her shoulders. Kind is the last word I've ever used to describe the man, but in this minute, there's a smile on his face I can't place. Tender by all means for someone as a, as obnoxious as him. It's a curious thing to see, if not a bit odd. Listen here, sweetie. Tia... Tia was already a great person before she met me. She is? But I don't see her doing anything. She's always at home. Not always, Munchkin. Did you know she's really good at numbers? You're good with them, too. You helped me with my homework once. Well, Tia's much, much better than me. She used to do maths with big numbers. Oh, like millions? <gasps> no, gazillions. And she's really, really good at it. So much so that her dad let her manage anything that had to do with it. That was even before she met me, too. Does that mean she's better than you? Oh, leagues, Munchkin. Way, way better than I'll ever be. For some reason, I don't think he's still talking about his wife's mathematical prowess as his voice trails off. In fact, if I had not been paying closer attention, I wouldn't have noticed a change in him. A slight shift in his smile from one that's tender to something wistful, like remembering a memory he has always been fond of, but has often kept himself. And at the fleeting glance of it, a tiny insignificant part of the world also somehow also shifts. Opinions changing, impressions moving. You know what? Why don't you ask Tia next time you have homework, hmm? Okay. Next time, I'll ask her to help out. See? No need to marry a good-for-nothing bloke. Can I also tell her to not stay at home anymore? If Tia's good at it, I'm sure she can help you out, too. Uh, I'm Papa. He computes a lot of numbers, too. Tia can help him. <laughs> you go do that. I'm sure she'll love to hear it, Munchkin. Even if it's been a while since. Another silence from him, then without missing a beat, he turns Kylie around and lightly pats her shoulder in a gesture to end their conversation right there, right here and there, probably before he can say other things he's never intended to say or say, or or a child is not meant to hear. Right, off you go first. I think I saw your friend run off to the other classroom. The one with the pigtails? Go say hi to her. You still have those jelly babies to give her, yes? All right, but wait for me, okay? I've got loads more to show you. He put up my drawing on the bulletin the other day. I'm going to take you there later. I'll be back. She soon disappears behind the small crowd, and the wiser to the sudden change in mood around her. Luke straightens as soon as she's gone. The expression on his face grows less kind now that there's no one to reassure. <laughs> Despite that, a chuckle still escapes me. His head quickly snaps at me, an accusing glare clear in his eyes. Although it's less threatening now, considering what I've witnessed earlier. Funny how one's... One person's impression of someone can easily change with that minute detail. Why are you laughing like that? M or minute. <laughs> Don't mind me. I just saw something surprising today. Don't let it bother you. You know, putting it like that won't make me any less inclined to ask. What is it, woman? If this is another one of your threats, I've already told you it isn't going to work on me. That good teacher act isn't going to fool anyone. What makes you think it has to do with you? I could have just remembered something funny. Not everything in this world revolves around you, mister. I am not daft, Daisy. It's on your face for all the world to see. 
Now, say it so we can be done with this stupid talk. <laughs> I let out another laugh. Want to delay then to express any sort of amusement over the matter. In truth, I don't know where to start. One wrong move, one wrong word, and I might offend this man. He's childish enough for that, even if what I'm about to say or are just mere honest observations. It's really weird seeing different sides of Luke. Like, way more than anyone else, really. I mean, maybe aside for Isabella. Because, like, you could see the front that Isabella puts up and, like, everything else behind it. But, in comparison, Luke is very... Like, there's a lot going on with him. Ah, oh, well, regardless of how he reacts, it's not like it'll have an impact on anything between us. I'm gonna have to check it now. Whoa, it went up. I have no plans of getting too friendly with the man, though he might have some good points emphasis on might. The best treatment I can hope myself to give him is to stop thinking of him as a sleazy douche. Besides, after seeing that look on him, I figure someone like him can use a little compliment here and there. He probably doesn't get it much, considering how coarse his own language can get. Can't you act a wee bit polite for even a second of your life? It won't kill you. You'll easily get answers that way, you know? Instead of demanding things from people like a temperamental man-child. I'll be nice when I want to be, woman. Don't tell me what to do. And here I was just thinking how you're doing a brilliant job as Kylie's guardian. Was I mistaken? Was I mistaken? What? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Stop playing dumb. I hate to admit it, but you actually seem to be good with kids. Possibly even better than most of the teachers here. Hm, what do you know? I've expected him to just take it all in, bloat his ego mo- Eagle? His ego more, and even brag about it. Instead, what I get from him is a s sound resembling a squawk. Or maybe that's him choking on his own pride. I can't tell above the hubbub surrounding us. But when I glance at him, only a mortified expression is on his face. No. No? You should be proud of yourself. At least there's this one good thing about you. Isn't that nice to hear? Pretty sure not a lot of compliments get thrown around about you, knowing how you are. There are a lot of good things about me, Daisy. My hair, for one. There's also my extraordinary good looks. Wax lyrical about those all you want. I'd be happy to hear it any day. And if you get me between the sheets, well... It'll be your lucky day. Praise anything about me, but that... What is so repulsive about it? Even Kylie likes you. Shouldn't that tell you anything about yourself? Kylie is one kid, not even my own. Trust me, you do not want to see me bring a spawn of my own into this world. It will be an abomination. Is that what you keep telling yourself? Maybe. Is it any of your business? No. But if I didn't know any better, I'd say this is because you yourself think you're a little piece of shite and somehow it'll pass on. It doesn't work like that, by the way. The last remark just came out. There might be a sliver of truth in it, but I shouldn't have phrased it like that. Even for my own standards or the kind of person I'm talking to, it's still quite rude. An apology is already at my throat, but the my, the minute I open <laughs> I was about to say my newt this time. <laughs> but the minute I open my mouth, all of all of what I've prepared myself to say dissipates. Lost in the moment in front of me. He has turned his gaze outside, staring at some point past the buildings blocking the view of the sky, equally lost in his thoughts. He's a vexing man under so many standards. However, in this moment, the morning light streaming from the window lends his features a certain air. Softer, less severe than what he often flaunts. Is because he's trying to compensate for something. I might as well be looking at a different man. There's a tender note in his voice when he finds it, the words muttered under his breath, not intended for anyone but himself. Nonetheless, it reaches my ears, unintentional as it may be. You're right. 
She deserves someone far better than me. Well, that talk about self-worth makes some sense now. It isn't some profound knowledge he pulled out of his arse. It has come about because he's already been there, likely still stuck in the middle of it. Preaching about your own personal experience is easier, after all. Less room for mistakes, more for a dose of self-loathing. What a complicated man. Just when you thought you've already figured him out, he does one thing and says the other. People like him are the most difficult to gauge, far harder to understand. Yet it might be exactly for this reason why some are so easily charmed by him. It's a mystery that catches them of wanting to find out what underneath that bravado. I won't count myself among those yet. His winning personality isn't exactly my cup of tea. But sometimes once you get a glimpse of what's beyond that... Machismo? Empathizing with a man isn't such a steep hill to climb. If the comfortable silence we now share tells anything, that is. Perhaps this is as close to friendship as we can get. Several insults flung around with a few shared silences in between, and that's not exactly a bad thing. He's not exactly a bad guy either, despite the, au the awkward start we've had. Maybe it's for, his, for this reason that I can't resist throwing in a little comment to lift his mood before leaving him. You know, Luke, you're not such a bad person. Is that supposed to make me feel better? I'm touched, Daisy. Take it how you will, but a little attitude change would help. A lot. Oh, bollocks. Right, of course. Let me know when you're done with your lecture, ma'am. And you can probably start by not leaving your wife out while you're having some quality time with your goddaughter. Who knows? Maybe that'll help change how the child sees her. Where did you even get the idea I'm leaving my wife out? Have you ever even met? No. But I did see her with you two last time. His indifferent expression quickly dissolves into a confused scowl while I meet it with matching perplexity. It has only been two days. Surely his memory isn't that bad. What? When was this? At the cafe. After you left. She was sitting right beside you. Kylie was at the back and you were driving. Daisy, are you sure you haven't accidentally hit yourself with your own book? Because that damn thing's quite thick. And I'm really getting worried about you. It has only been a few days, and concussions can be dangerous. I suggest you have that checked. Well, you asked. I just answered. It's pretty rude to make her wait like that, by the way. How can I make her wait when she's not even with us? What? It was just Kylie and I that night. <laughs> now you're just pulling my leg. <sighs> Luke exhales long and drawn out, his impatience rapidly changing the companionable air around us, and the face of it I tense. I've accidentally stepped into another minefield. Any chat I've had with him so far has been like this. Why this still surprises me, escapes me, but above my worries of offending the man is my own bewilderment. I remember well enough that I saw that night, yet he says something completely different. Wifey was out with Kylie's mummy that night. She wasn't with us. How do you think I ended up on babysitting duty? B but... It, in the front seat. And Kylie's... <laughs> this big. Kylie's sobs reach my ears first and then her familiar weight returns around my waist again. Hot tears seep through my blouse as she buries her face in it, her arms winding tightly around me. Luke and I briefly exchange worried glances as his own lips shut tight with concern. Her cries are soft enough not to attract much attention, most of the visitors have been ushered inside the rooms by now anyway. Those that still linger, though, watch our little group with great interest and concern. If I don't get a better handle of the situation, I have a feeling Luke will start yelling at everyone soon. Kneeling, I gently pull the girl away from me, cupping her face and wiping away tears, creating little trails on her cheeks. Her mouth is drawn in a miserable pout when she peers at me. All right, Kylie. Calm down. What happened? <laughs> it's my friend. That's a little too vague, Munchkin. Let her speak, Luke. Who is it, Kylie? Melody? Or was it the other one? Yeah. Did the two of you fight? She nods and immediately clams up after letting her sobs communicate the story instead, or as much as her shaking shoulders can tell me. Right behind me, Luke gives a nervous huff while she shifts on his while he shifts on his feet. He must not be used to handling children crying. What a wuss. Sweetie, I won't be able to help you if you don't tell me what happened. Seconds pass before she responds again. 
The tears are already gone when she finally musters the strength to talk, her cry subsiding to mere sniffles. I wanted to give her the rest of the jelly babies, but she won't come out. Where? Where is she? In the little girl's room. Is she still there? Another nod. I won't say what's wrong. I kept asking her, but she told me to go away. Career day's going to start soon. I saw the prize and Miss Alice will give us up for good. She's going to miss it. Is that what you told her? Yeah. She won't listen. She won't even take the jelly babies. After he saved it for her, too. She and Luke wanted to eat the red ones, but I told him it's not for him. Miss Pink, can you talk to her? Tell her to come out. And I'm really upset with her. Ah. Just a little childish argument, then. Times like this, I'm glad I teach teenagers mature enough for petty squabbles. I do love being around children and won't mind having one or two of my own in the future, but it takes a whole different level of patience to teach several of them. I honestly admire my colleagues who willingly took the challenge. Normally, I'll leave this for the homeroom teachers to fix, but I can't just ignore the imploring look she shoots me. That's another weakness I'll have to steel myself against before I ever think of having a one of my own. But now I give in to it. Okay, tell me where she is, sweetie. Sighing, I stand up and gesture for her to lead the way. Luke trails quietly behind us. Even with the small distance in between, his apprehension is palpable, understandably so. No one wants to be caught in the middle of a children's spat. But in the end, this is all just a part of my job. I can't just shy away from it, can I? Kylie escorts us to an adjacent hall. Oh, no. <clears throat> she didn't specify Wix one, but I think we know Wix one. <laughs> At this hour, the corridors and the rooms lining its sides are empty. Save for the gentle rustling of leaves, the twittering of birds outside, and the tapping of our foot against the floor, the whole area stays eerily quiet. Not unusual, though. This is the part of the building reserved for club activities at the end of the school day, and with the rest of the school busy with another event, it's only natural for it to be this deserted. Come afternoon right after class, it'll once again be filled with people. For the time being, I focus on the toilets at the far end, headed straight for it. Luke stays behind, opting to wait for the, for the end of this drama instead, obviously not wanting to deal with another person's kid. Meanwhile, Kylie follows right after me, unusually silent as we approach the ladies' room. Sometime before we made the turn down the hallway, she had stopped sniffling and started singing a tune under her breath. No! No! Omen! Probably to brace or calm herself, or maybe this is her way of preparing to pull her friend out of her sulk. It certainly reminds me of another person. I make no remarks on it, however. It's all part of growing up, they say. Let her learn. The door is slightly ajar when we get to it, and from inside the sobs of a girl echo weakly. Barely audible, even in this kind of hush. Turns out Kylie's not the only one upset about this. Despite the situation, a smile forms on my lips as I call out to her friend. Hello? Hello there? You're Kylie's friend, aren't you? Melody, is it? She's looking for you. Children can be so amusing sometimes. Granted, they can be exasperating. Especially around this age, but the endearing things about them outweigh those. All you need is enough level of patience. Career day's about to start, too. You'll have to come out, or you're going to be really late for it. Miss Alice won't be happy if one of her kids isn't there. I heard she brought little gifts for everyone who'll behave. Don't you want to receive one? However, her cries show no signs of abating. They only grow louder. Not close to a wail. Alarming, regardless. Um, are you okay? From where I'm standing, it sounds almost like she's in some kind of pain and it's not impossible. They do that at times, hiding what ails them for fear of reprimand. If it's like that, coaxing her out might be useless. It also makes sense why she chose to she chose the loo for this from their classroom. Wasting no time, I gesture for Kylie to wait and amble towards the door calmly so I don't alarm her. At the same time, a distinct sense of deja vu hits me. I've been in this position before, behind a door with someone crying on the other side, my calls ignored as the cries grow into a wail. Just this past week, actually. Even so, being in the same situation before doesn't bring any comfort. I'm putting up for the child beside me is a thick of un undercurrent of worry, trickling into my stomach. I take one last breath, then I nudge open the door. It all happens in the span of a second. I don't make it past two steps into the room. Her cries abruptly stop. 
Light footsteps shuffle behind me, coming to a halt at the door. My heart skips a beat. And when I turn... Kylie? Nope. 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 This is why I don't work with children. <laughs> Miss Pink? Miss Pink? Why didn't you help her? My whole body becomes motionless at the sight of her words catching in my throat and heart pounding rapidly against my chest. This is Kylie, I'm sure of it. But nothing in the manner she speaks or the way she tilts her head in question carries a youthful, innocent vibe she always brings with her. As if I'm merely looking at a dead hollow imitation of the child. Can you hear her? She's asking for your help. But it's not those that trigger a memory. It's those chilling eyes, calling, beckoning. Why won't you listen to her? All at once the memory returns to me. A tide that has receded and now returns to shore, with an overwhelming force carrying images of a single moment from days ago. Of a world passing by in a blur and of features I can barely discern under the little light there was. Not even a week has passed. In this minute, while I keep my eyes trained on a child before me, they return with such unbearable clarity. There are no horrid wounds this time, no blood streaming down a pale face, thank heavens. Just lips contorted into a smile, a small, twisted smile. They brim with venom I've never expected to ever see in a child, sending tiny pinpricks of dread crawling up my limbs and winding up my neck. You're a bad person. People like you deserve to die. Ouch. I can't breathe. <laughs> Those whispers and laughters again. Judging, mocking, taunting. Each scathing word ringing sharp and true against my ears. My throat closes in. My whole body tenses. A chill settles at the tips of my fingers, every digit gone rigid from the cold. With every single draw of breath and each struggle for air or freedom, the coils wrapped around my body tighten, dragging me down. A gradual, torturous descent into another bottomless abyss. On, and on, and on, until I lose touch with myself and the world. Until darkness claims me and, unexpectedly, a note. In the distance, harsh and piercing, cutting through the thick stupor and shattering the haze without warning. Are you ladies done with your business here? I don't have all morning to wait for you two. <gasps> My eyes snap open and the world shifts into place with a ragged gasp. When I glance up, a different set of eyes greet me. Are you okay, Miss Pink? No anger. No vile hatred in them. Just plain, sincere concern. Bit by bit, I become aware of my surroundings and myself as warmth, as warmth steadily slips back to me. I've reached out for the nearby counter to steady myself at some point, and my knuckles have gone white from how rigid my grip on it is. It's over now, yet the tension hasn't left my body. My heart still hammers hard against my chest in an erratic rhythm, and my breathing still comes in short, shallow bursts. Before me, Kylie fumbles with her hands, utterly unsure of what to do to an, to an adult, in what's probably a laughable state. Did you get No need. Just, just leave me alone. Do you know how to fix you? Oh, wait, okay? I wish I can speak reassurances to her, but I can't shake it off. The dread is there twisting at my insides in anticipation. Of what? I'm no longer sure. Pushing myself off the counter, I break off into a run, brushing off the anxious look Kylie gives me, and I gently push her away on my way out, or the furrow in Luke's brows when I stumble into him outside. Whatever they both saw on my face, I care not to know. Bloody hell, I don't even understand what's happening anymore. The tremors continue long after the last of my classes have ended. Although none of my students have commented on it, I've caught a few share sharing anxious glances every time a pen slips from my hand, and my shoulders tense whenever called. How unusual it must be for them to see the normally composed Miss Gales become a bundle of nerves. Even the most boisterous ones have given me less grief today. You think being on my fourth cup of tea would provide any sort of comfort? Or is this the fifth? Ye god, why does counting matter now? The fact that I can't easily shake it off this time should tell me something. The last time this happened, I passed it off as some lapse in my part after being sick for the week before. And it is a natural conclusion. Those are just stories, a centuries-old lore passed by the locals to keep children in line. What place doesn't have those? 
One of my dad's books even went as far as to describe them as a strong part of Isabella's culture. Tree giants, women who feed on unborn children straight from a mother's womb, or hell, there's even that one story about a demon baby. All folklore that never had a smidgen of truth in it was probably told to scare off the natives there back in the old days. Much like every other one in every other place. The world is more universal than people care to think, but looking at it from where I'm standing now, after staring right into the eyes of that woman, after all the things I've been hearing and feeling, perhaps. Perhaps there's really more to the bloody letter than some ho than some awful Halloween prank. Perhaps Isabella's right all along. A terrible thing, if true. Though that thought doesn't linger long, thankfully. Soon the ringing of my mobile takes my attention away from it. An unfamiliar name flashes before me once the screen lights up and my brows knit together. Marianne McCalla. Staring hard at the screen, I try to remember when I've entered this person on my contact list. It takes a moment, but when it clicks, my eyes zero in on the book lying wide open on my table. Loaned out from the library almost a week ago. I met the woman there by sheer, sheer coincidence. A fellow history buff, apparently. We were after the same book, but in the end, she's given it to me under the condition that I call her once I'm done. To be honest, I've forgotten about it until now, and well, I haven't really taken a peek at it until today. Normally I'd be done with the whole volume of this size a few days after taking it out, about one or two depending on how busy I am. But finding a chance to sit down and read through it has been more difficult lately than I anticipated. One moment I'm busy simply grading worksheets attending a movie premiere the next, and someone suddenly inviting me out for one reason or another. Days later, a friend stops showing up in her flat right after worrying reports pop up on the local news. There simply isn't enough time to breathe and get a grip on things. I have been flipping through the pages of said book moments ago, though, never really reading anything and merely hoping for a distraction. To no avail. My phone gives another ring, and this time I do not hesitate to answer. Marianne? I dismissed my last class a few minutes ago. I'm pretty much free for the rest of the afternoon. Unless something comes up. Uh, is this about last time? Uh, the book? Mm, not really. I was hoping to ask you about some other thing. Oh, sure. Uh, what about? You... You grew up in the city, didn't you? It's a peculiar question to ask someone. You've just met, but I answer her nevertheless. I'm more curious where she's heading heading with this by starting with that. Born and raised, third generation migrant. Why do you ask? So, you must be familiar with the local lore. The, uh, stories? Quite. If I'm going to teach about history, I'd like to think I am, yeah? But a family friend would be a better person to ask. If you want, I can contact him for you. No, let's just keep this Alright, I really don't know how else to put this without sounding a bit crazy, uh, but things have been really, uh, you know, odd. Do you remember the mansion I mentioned back when we met? My current project? In hindsight, I should have expected it'll lead to this. She must not have lived here long if she's just asking about it now. It didn't take a week with Isabella when she arrived, but that's Isabella. Superstition's down to the last hair. Though I won't be too far off to think Marianne has only started thinking about this recently. She's working on the damn house itself. I must admit, even I'm curious now, despite living here for so many years and having so many chances to look it up before. The Ermengarde Mansion, yes? Yes, that one. And, um, uh, the thing is... Uh, the thing is... Oh dear, this is a bad idea. You, you know what? Just, just forget I ever called you about this. It must have been the sunny weather. It's making me sick and see stupid things. See things. No, wait. It's all right. I don't mind. There's a moment's pause before she responds again. She's right in that this is a silly thing to talk about, especially between what I assume two people who are pretty grounded on their beliefs with regards to these things. I won't blame her if she hesitates. <sighs> It's fine. Why don't you just think of it as some form of research? Well, alright. But after this, 
We're going to forget we ever had this talk. My lips will be sealed. Now, what is it about the mansion? Just... What do you know about it? The, the general gist. The place is past. What happened to the owners? Anything you can give me. Hmm. Let's see. To start off... I do my best to give her a concise summary of the time the house was commissioned 400 years ago and who had built it. Up to the point it got deserted after the last heir's death and the deed was passed on the Ermengarde's nearest relatives. Frankly, if it weren't for those urban legends persisting, the house would have already faded into obscurity long ago. Demolished, even. These are all nothing she probably hasn't heard of before, yet there's dissatisfaction in her tone once I finish. That's all there really is to it? As far as I know. There's this little bit I forgot to mention about Lady Charlotte Ermengarde's death, but most of those are just theories. Aside from that, this is really everything we've been teaching all these years. Should there be anything more? No... no mention of any other weird stuff? Other crazy stories? Or... or a letter of some sort? My blood runs cold. Any warmth and comfort the tea I've drank has given me prior has instantly been drained out of me. The phone creaks softly as my light hold on it turns into a firm grip. This whole letter bullshite is starting to turn into more than a coincidence. None that I've heard or read of. What does a letter have to do with this? Oh, uh, no. It, it was just something I uh, came across. Ignore it. Random thoughts, you know? By the way, I need to run. She ends the call abruptly with only a clip goodbye, leaving my mind heavy with even more thoughts. The mood around my classroom has gone considerably denser in light of what little I've gleaned from that conversation. I don't think Marianne's lying about her intent. Her interest is genuine. I'd give her that, but she's left a lot of things out. I get the sense she's only asked because something's happened around her too. And if she hadn't mentioned the letter, I probably would have made the connection. Just what the hell did we get ourselves into? Of course, there's still a lot of confusing details in this. All of these are just assumptions. No concrete conclusions of, to be formed for, with what we have. And if we want to find out what we're really dealing with, I think. I think Marianne's right. There might be something more to these stories. As absurd as it sounds, the very place that gave us that letter might tell us something beyond what we know. And tomorrow night, I... I have a few hours of that chance at the housewarming party. Totally not an exciting thought, since the place is privately owned now. I can't just wander around. But it's enough to reason... But it's enough reason to keep the dread at bay as I step out of the room, ready to put an end to this day. However, all those good vibes disappear into thin air when I turn head first into Luke. There's really something in this man. Regardless of how much my opinion of him has changed over the span of a few hours, he simply blasts through every good impression people have of him without care of thought, or thought. He doesn't even need to open his mouth, his mere presence does it. In all honesty, I think he's kind of, he's the kind of guy only a mother can love. You're still here? Obviously. Who do you think standing in front of you? An ass. Oh, come on, Daisy, you've done better than that. Losing your touch? Luke, I don't have time for this. I'm heading home. And your face is the last thing I want to see before I leave. What do you want? Belatedly, I notice his hand. Partly raised, almost posed for a knock. At a slight lift of my eyebrow, he quickly drops it to his side and turns to Kylie. She's standing a few steps away from him, holding her hands behind her back and towing at something on the floor with the tip of a shoe. Then he proceeds to make vague gestures at me and the child. He resembles a fish flopping for air with the way he's moving his arms, though I think he's trying to urge her to speak up. Munchkin, I thought you wanted to tell her something. You do it, Tio. This wasn't my idea, darling. Don't worry. I won't tell Tio what you told me the other day. And this morning. <sighs> Luke exhales, rolling his eyes at the ceiling and maybe praying for the universe to grant him more patience. He knows a losing battle when he sees one. He may act worse than a five-year-old throwing a tantrum at times, but he's no match for an actual child. Nothing better than being served a dose of his own medicine, huh? Once his frustration has been promptly let out, he points a rude finger at me. I do my best to stare the offending digit down, but I can already hear the demand before it's even out of his lips. 
You, come with us. What makes you think I will? Because little Rugrat here is upset and worried, and it's your bloody fault. I've no idea what happened this morning, but if you don't come with us, I won't be hearing the end of it from her. So do me a favor, Daisy, and just be glad I'm inviting you. You're asking for a favor, and you can't be bothered to be polite? I don't know. It's been a really busy day for me. I kind of miss my couch. Daisy, you just... just say yes. A pause follows, almost too dramatic. After which his face twists into something between a grimace and a smile. As it happens, he appears like he's in a lot of physical pain. You'd think the man is getting an aneurysm by simply being polite. Please? Tia said it'll be his treat. What? I said no such thing, Munchkin. I only agreed to this because you requested it. I'm under no obligation to feed her. I promise we'll be quiet the next time I visit. Oh, all right, but just one meal and make it the cheapest. He and Ashton will get along famously on that department. On a different front, the offer of free dinner does sound enticing, however half-heartedly given it is. Mostly because Kylie has wisely put on her puppy eyes, and by the second I find all my choices slipping away from me. See, Miss Pink? It'll be fun! You don't have to feel sad anymore, okay? Oh, I lie. My mobile buzzes from my pocket, cutting me mid-sentence, and for a second I'm spared from the act of giving an answer I'll regret, either way. Fishing the gadget out, I wave a hand at him and excuse myself, a disgruntled expression on it is on Luke's face before I turn away. I'd be lying if I, if I say it didn't amuse me. He's as eager to be done with this as I am, but what can I do? Checking a message from Ashton showed up. Hey Becca, I'll be around Salem this evening. Need to meet someone in the area. I might have to drop by yours and Isabella's place after. See ya. Oh. Just the usual. Unlike what he does to Zachary, Ashton has a decency to let us know when he's dropping by, or he's in the area for some business. From the way it's phrased, it sounds to be the latter. Either way, I'm glad he's at least aware of the boundary. Not that Isabella's ever going to let him leave the building unscathed, if he ever pulls the same stunt he does with the other man. I cringe to imagine what she'll do to him. Sighing, I slip the gadget back to my pocket. When looking up to see Luke's utter impatience on his face, I now... I now face a different dilemma. The two of them are waiting, and knowing the kind of person Luke is, is, is already a grand gesture of goodwill coming from him. All to please his godchild. His denials aside, it's easy to tell he's really fond of Kylie from his actions alone. I kinda hate to ruin it. Well, Daisy, we're waiting here. On the other hand, there's Ash. His message didn't exactly imply he's going to wait, or he's expecting me to be there, but there are matters I hope to discuss with him in person, to put it simply. Housewarming party matters. With inviting Isabella out of the question, I only have Zachary and Ashton. Although the former has already made it clear he'll be busy this week, and while well, Ashton has been my first choice from the start. Even if he detests attending gatherings like this. It's company that counts. We can be miserable together. But that's the problem, isn't it? He hates them, and it's very likely his answer will be a flat no. I'd rather not hear that. If, by some miracle, he agrees to it, he'll probably be sulking the whole party. Not really a tough choice when you put it like that, still. Tough choice, but I have to pick one. I already know that Ashton's at the party, so why should I bother? <laughs> In the end, it's my own fondness for Kylie that wins out. Chances are I'll only have to endure his presence for an hour or so. If it lasts more than that, I can make up an excuse, a sudden call from a friend, or things to work on. It doesn't seem so bad when I think of the pros and cons. At best, it'll be a quiet dinner. At worst, it'll be an awkward affair we're both eager to get rid of. I just want to spend his money. <laughs> I'm leaning more on the latter happening, hoping for the former, of course. Okay, but only because Kylie asked. Kylie's face instantly lights up. For the third time today, she tackles me into a hug before pulling away and dragging me by the hand towards the building's exit. That's alright. I'm sure Tio doesn't mind. He let me pick where we're going to eat. Don't worry, it's just close. Luke follows closely behind, and perhaps out of some desire to keep the dead air away, I can't resist throwing in a quip. Keep your distance. You better not do anything funny, you hear? I'm the one who should keep my distance. May I remind you who approached me first and what you did right after? Oh, I remember it clearly. But perhaps it's you who needs a reminder. 
You seem to have never learned your lesson. Care we give it another try? Maybe this time it'll stick. Maybe this time it'll stick. You think you're scary, but I'll show you what's scary. To my surprise, his tone lacks the usual sardonic note, and in briefly I pause to stare at him. He quickly shuts his mouth right after and walks ahead of us. All talking, no trousers like the usual, and for the better part of the part of our walk, except for Kylie's excited chatter, we don't speak. Somehow I have this feel this strange feeling. I'm already getting used to this kind of banter with him. I'm not sure if it's a good or bad thing. And amidst his newfound friendship, dare I call it that, Ashton's message lays forgotten and abandoned in my pocket. Of all the places nearest the school, Kylie picks this one and waiting for and waiting for food to be served is an awkward is as awkward as I've imagined it would be. Of the bad sort, though. The pleasant kind. Surprisingly, Luke's an okay bloke when he tries. When he tries. So long as you're willing to look past the tac tactless remarks, or we're not exchanging acerbic quips. It's clear he's making an effort for this to be as fun as possible for the six-year-old by being chattier, even going as far as to laugh when Kylie's story calls for it. It's an interesting thing to hear from the man. More than once, I catch his frequent cheesed-off expression easing whenever he looks at the girl. And your friend? Did you make up with her? Yep! She said she just saw something she didn't like. She didn't accept the jellies, though. She told me to give it to you instead. She knows you like the red ones, too. Very well. Hand it to me later. I'll bring some of them home. And I think your Tia would love to have some. What a terrible liar. He says he dislikes the idea of having children of his own, but it's easy to see some part of him genuinely, genuine, genuinely wants them. What's stopping him? Once Kylie wanders to the nearby bookshelf, after having lost interest in the conversation, however, we both revert back to silence. On our own, we have little to talk about aside from a few questions about the other here and there. At one point, it does veer on local politics and history. He's surprisingly versed with it, that he can hold a decent conversation without throwing a jib. Nothing too personal is ever mentioned so far, though. It's too early for those, and besides, I don't like him enough to speak of every minute detail. Minute detail of my life. Better keep it strictly between the silence and casual party. This whole thing already looks and feels wrong on so many levels, I'm quite sure he feels the same. So when another bout of silence hits us and becomes too much, I've taken to finding something else to occupy myself. Toying with my mobile, turning it from hand to hand while we wait for our respective meals. But it'll be a complete lie if I say I'm not waiting for some intervention. Something to pull me away from this place. Someone. Ashton's probably at Salem Well by this time working on whatever business he has there. Maybe if I make up an excuse and leave now, I can still catch him. Cut that out. It's distracting. My hand stills, holding the gadget awkwardly between us, arrested mid-pass mid by his bored tone. He's been quiet for a long time now after complaining about how appalling the tea they're serving here is. Before that, he has whined about how uncomfortable his chair is and tasteless the decorations they have, have here. Previous to that, he had... He has griped about how dull this place is compared to the one he frequents on the upper class side of the city. Well, I'm sorry for being a bunch of peasants, your majesty. Figures he'll lose patience soon, having already grumbled about almost everything his eyes can reach. It's just unfortunate he's turned to me now. Why don't you just look somewhere else? I can't. If I turn elsewhere, I might end up looking at the Bob Fock right behind us. <gasps> Bob Fock? Do I even want to ask? I don't want to hear it. If it's coming out of his mouth, he can only be either rude or offensive. Regardless, he continues. Everything looks good. But have you seen the face? True horror. <laughs> what is wrong with you? You know, I frown about this in practice, but that mouth needs to be washed out with a particularly potent soap. Preferably by your own mum. A shame she isn't here, hmm? For whatever reason, that puts an end to that talk right away. He returns to watching his godchild, who had found a particularly interesting picture book and is now poring over it, while I turn back to my mobile. Still no message. Would it kill him to at least send a message, check if I were home? Meanwhile, Luke's silence lasts all but ten seconds. What is it with the damn mobile? Are you on a curfew? 
He's got the image of act down pat, I'll give him that. Seriously, how old is this guy? Has he somehow been deprived of affection during childhood? What is it to you? I don't think it's any of your business what I do with it. It is my business, all right? One, I'm the one paying here. Two, I'm being forced to eat dinner in a place this stuffed and noisy. Lastly, it's been ten minutes, the food isn't here, and I'm hungry. What you're doing with the mobile is annoying and distracting. When the least you could do is keep things entertaining while I suffer. That's your problem? Shouldn't you be more worried about how this entire affair looks to other people? Oh, I didn't realize this was one. Just two parents with their blue-haired child. Two parents who don't like each other at all. You move fast, Daisy. You could have informed me first, you know. Had I known, I would have taken you someplace nicer. Certainly the kind with better food and plenty of good wine. Uh, why did I ever think this was a good idea? Did it ever occur to you how inappropriate this might look to everyone? <laughs> why should I care? It's only inappropriate if you make it out to be. Relax, I won't do anything to make your boyfriend angry. He doesn't even need to know we dined out. It'll be our dirty little secret. He's not my boyfriend! The words come out with more force than I've intended. By the time I realize my slip up, his lips are already spread into a sneer. Heat slowly crawls up in my face. Oh, so there is someone. You're so easy to read. Briefly, his eyes search my face. I have no idea what he sees, nor do I care to know. But in the next second, he barks out a laugh, displaying his amusement without reserve to everyone within earshot. In that moment, I know I flipped a switch in him somewhere, and I've lost my chance to deny his assumptions. Do I even want to? Isn't that the reason why I've been so focused on my mobile, waiting for another message for him? For a reason to dump this awkward meeting to go after him. <laughs> Look how mottled you are. Now the nickname makes more sense. Shy Miss Pink and her cute little crush. The color suits you, by the way. It matches the hair. It's not a crush! Classic denial. But in reality, you want him to be yours. And your every move is made to make him notice you. In fact... You don't want him to see you with another man in a non-professional capacity. Because he might misinterpret it. The same thing goes for you, doesn't it? Bloody, yours is even worse. What about your wife? Aren't you concerned she might misinterpret this? Daisy, just because we tied the knot doesn't mean we have to be joined at the hip at every single opportunity. Don't be ridiculous! Why else would you marry her if you don't want to be with her for the rest of your lives? Because, Daisy, she also has other things she can do with her life and friends to spend time with. Granted, I don't like some of them and I have a few of my own she utterly dislikes. But wifey doesn't have to know my every move. Nor do I hers. Do you know how boring that would be? To be with the same person for all hours of the day. Losing sleep over the mere fact they're not with you. Or putting everything you have aside to please them? To have your whole world revolve around one person? Aren't you just mistaking that for something else? Unlike you, there are other people here who don't share the same jaded outlook you have. Don't lump everyone together just because it didn't work out for you. <laughs> and you, my dear, are unexpectedly naive. What's so naive about it? If you love each other, wouldn't you want to always see them? Be with them? To have them focus solely on you? Maybe you haven't been loved enough. Oh, it's that kind of thing for you, isn't it? The love is eternal, love is a strong emotion shite. A starry-eyed girl pining for her dashing Prince Charming? What's next? Romantic confessions of love? A grand wedding on the beach? Dozens of spawns running around in some picturesque home in the suburbs? How quaint. Are you also expecting it's going to be sunshine and rainbows after? A happily ever after? Please. What? I never once said... Uh, and is all of that such a bad thing to hope for? <laughs> Woman, I've been married for seven years, and I'm telling you, it's far from what you have in your pretty red head. Tell me, how long has this song and dance been going for you and your man? Maybe I am mistaken. 
Averting my eyes from him is all I manage to do. What does his mere seven years have compared to the seventeen I've had with Ash? It's laughable he thinks those two things are even comparable. Ash and I may have never moved past the boundaries of friendship, like what I'm hoping for, like what I'm hoping for years. But what we have isn't something anyone can scoff at. I've always been by his side, endured everything with him. I know him better than anyone. No matter what this man, this complete stranger says, I know there will always be a place for me beside him. And yet, and yet. Come on, Daisy. That shouldn't be too hard. Three, five, eight, ten, twenty. His words easily seep into my heart like sharp daggers, gradually picking apart everything I've ever been sure of. Despite myself, the doubts resurface and my defenses crumble right in front of my eyes. It's no wonder he sees through me, and as expected, he ridicules it. <laughs> Restrained, low and rumbling, a sharp sound strikes the air around us amidst, amidst the, mu the murmur of people and the soft notes of the music playing over our heads. His shoulders shake, and when his mirth becomes too much, even for him, he reaches up a hand and presses it over his face, as if to hold his glee close to him. Bloody bollocks, this is just brilliant! <laughs> Oh, mother, why do I always keep running into these things? This day couldn't get any better. I think I'm gonna need a stiff drink after this. <laughs> he dissolves into another peal of laughter, but when it subsides, what he has for me are more words. Scathing, each of them. The urge to run from here has never been this strong. Is everything you said how you plan to act? If that man of yours ever ends up with you, cling to him? Put him on a bloody pedestal? Let him become the center of your universe? <laughs> Although, with how long this seems to be going on, I think you've already done so. Marriage will just be icing on the top. Like some sort of reward for you, isn't it? For being a good, patient, loyal little girl all this time. Never looking at another man. He must have been having a grand time with someone pining over him this long. I'm a little envious, to be honest. Maybe also a little surprised he hasn't suffocated from all your attention yet. <laughs> Laugh all about it if you want. It's not like you'll ever understand. Luke falls silent. The ridicule in him is gone in an instant, and his eyes meet mine sharp and imposing. A challenge, but I hold it against him with the same intensity, because if there's something I won't let his opinion trample on, it's this. What does he know? However, he's the one who looks away, focusing his eyes back to where Kylie is, and for a moment I believe I've won. Until he draws in a breath and turns back to me. The words he drops next, though, hushed, hang heavily in the distance between us. You're right. I won't. But I do know not to mistake love for obsession, woman. They are not the same thing. It rattles. Out of everything he said tonight, this is the one thing that twinges my heart. Maybe it's in the manner he delivers the lack of consent, conceit in his posture, or an underlying insult in the one he takes. The remark is not meaning to cut, merely to express this simple truth. This time it's him who holds, who holds a gaze against mine. Another unspoken challenge, and I realize that, if this happened minutes before, I'd already have an equally sharing retort on the tip of my tongue. There's none. But the anger is there, ringing at my inside, prodding at the uncertainties I've long kept. Isn't it enough? We have the long years we've been together. We have the memories. Whenever he needs me, until other people came in between us, I've always been the one there. That dedication and loyalty should mean something, shouldn't it? I've always been sure of it, and that one day he'll see it for what it is. In spite of that, in this minute, under this, this man's scrutiny, my own heart wavers. Now I struggle to find the words. What right do you have? I don't need to answer that. However, those are for me to ponder on. This this arse doesn't need to hear them, and neither is he entitled for, to them just to, just because he dished out some profound-sounding life wisdom no one asked for. So I look away, hoping my own silence would be enough of, a, of an answer for him. And it is for a moment. Up until warm, furious tears prickle behind my eyes, stinging, begging for release, along with every other frustration this dumb talk has built up in me. All because of this man. I hate him. I hate the fact that he has to be the one to see me in this sorry state. I'm already expecting another barb from him when his expression shifts. Except he panics. In the span of three seconds, his expression changes from indifference to concern to utter panic. 
It would probably have been funny if it weren't so irked by the idea, by the sight of his glycid bastard. Hey, hey, are you crying? Are you going to cry? Stop that right now, woman, or I'll... Will you shut up? He clams up almost before I can finish. Whether this is due to the sudden force in my voice or how I look, I pretend not to think of it. He seems like a deer caught in the headlights with the way he's making himself smaller in his seat. But I'm still pissed. I'm tired, and if I can punch him, I can at least scream at him. If I can't. Bag of dick, you know that? If I hear another word from you, I'm sewing that bloody mouth shut myself. It does do the trick. Not to the effect I've hoped, but the moment I've snapped at him, the stinging at the back of my eyes melts away, and a strange calm overcomes me. A fragile thing when found in the middle of a busy coffee shop. Nevertheless, it's appreciated considering it does, doesn't does last, immediately broken by the very person that put me in the state with a few awkward pats to my shoulder. Done twice. Thrice. And another. Until my patient runs out again and I'm pulling out the book from my bag, raising it threatening, threateningly over his head. It'll surely dent his skull if it slams down at this height. Part of me wants to see that, but I restrain myself. He has a good sense to recoil, though. Shortly, he shrinks back to his seat and waves his hand in front of him in a gesture of surrender. Watch that book, woman. I already warned you about your little threats. You, you don't want to see my brand of angry. Then keep your hands to yourself. All right, that's it. People these days, I swear you treat them nicely and this is where it gets me. You're the last person I'd ever want to comfort me. Even if we're the only two remaining people on Earth. Don't flatter yourself. Immediate thought. You think if I kill everyone else and leave these two alone, anything would come of it? Okay, have it your way, Daisy. And stop calling me Daisy! I have a name, you know! He mutters something inaudible under his breath, though afterwards he doesn't say anything further. For the next minute, he simply contents himself with making a mess out of the paper napkins, folding them into clean shapes without any clear intent, before crumpling them in his hand when he loses interest in dumping them in a small pile in front of him. A waiter serves our meal soon enough and Kylie makes her way back to our table, but before I can take a single bite, he mutters something. The words spoken in the same tone he's used since morning, all under his breath whenever the honest part of him would show. Despite my rather confusing opinion of the man, I stop short of shoving food into my mouth to look at him. His eyes are on his food as he speaks, busy busying himself with cutting a portion of meat on his plate. But what comes out of him only rings true against my ears above the din of the coffee house. For what it's worth, Rebecca, I didn't ever think that's all there is to you. Why else would I leave my own goddaughter in your care if you're just some lovesick woman? He spears a piece of his food, pops it into his mouth, and that's it. One whole day with this man and I still can't figure out what his deal is. But for what it's worth as well, I don't think he's an entirely bad guy. The rest of our meal slips by in silence afterwards. Aside from Kylie's occasional chatter, the whole dinner goes by without another word exchanged between the two of us. Somehow we manage to make it through the whole thing without triggering another tension-riddled conversation. A good thing, perhaps. One, because Kylie's sitting in front of us, and two, I probably won't be able to hold a proper conversation with my mind heavy with thoughts. We depart from the coffee house just as the evening crowd starts to thin out. The same wordless silence fills our short walk back to the school. Except for when Luke gestures at a nearby coffee, <laughs> nearby flower shop and enters it without waiting for Kylie and I. He emerges minutes after carrying a bouquet of daffodil with the same softened expression on his face. Unlike the previous ones, he tucks it, he tucks this one away almost as soon as he looks up at us at the moment he's not willing to share. At my confusion, he merely answers with a shrug and con continues so walking. I accept it for what it is, if only because he doesn't owe me an explanation. It does leave more questions about him, each one as baffling as the previous ones. Those are the last words spoken this evening before we head our own ways. Up until I leave, up until I arrive home, I still can't understand him. Here, however, a whole different set of questions await me, and much like everything today, it comes with the littlest of things. A lone note greets me upon reaching my unit's door, its edges flutter tightly against lightly against the faint warm breeze passing through the small complex. Anne stops short of twisting the knob as I stare at it, though I don't make any moves to take it. 
Drop by earlier. You weren't around. Any ideas where Scaredy Cat is? Can't contact her. Inspector Abigail has a few questions. LPD stuff. Something about her dead co-workers. Anyway, let me know how the two of you have been doing. I'll see you later, Ash. Ashton's neat script lines its surface. The message he left short and straight to the point, but not without the underlying hint of friendship. He's looking for Isabella, apparently. Something about LPD's investigation of her co-worker's str death, but ended its formal tone by checking on me. Us. Any other day, the former part of his message will likely prod at the perceiving envy I've been holding, while the latter will probably send my heart to flutter. No things from him that I want to mean something more. At this time, only guilt fills me and my eyes briefly shift towards Isabella's empty unit. Luke's words repeat inside my head as I do so. What's worth, Rebecca? I didn't ever think that's all there is to you. Why else would I leave my own goddaughter in your care if you're just some lovesick woman? Have I always been like this? The selfish. In truth, I've intended to call Ash after that dinner if I didn't catch him here, invite him to that party like I've planned. There's time and he's still probably awake at around this hour. But my hands won't move, and perhaps it is for the better. Until I've had the time to think this through, it'll be best if I distance myself from those I've been clinging tightly to. Find a different perspective and see things for what they are. With a soft sigh, I reach for the note and crumple it under my hand. The knob twists open with much ease when I enter this time. Maybe after some introspection, it'll be easier. For tomorrow, I'll have that woman in the mansion to worry about. It's not over yet! Oh, no. I've already been at this for too long. I'm going to have to finish it. <sighs> we'll come back. I'm not going to even close out. It's just I'll be back. <laughs> the left side of my brain hurts. I can't do this. Whoa. The only person who's really <laughs> not even his own wife is that high up in the relationship. And I forgot to do the journal stuff, but I think we we either do it at the very end of this or at the beginning of the next point of view. So I'm not gonna even look at the branch tree, cause whatever's <laughs> see you in like a second but like not a second for me